Good afternoon and welcome to Pan Engineering's third Joseph Bordonia Forum. It's a great pleasure to see all of you here. Um, I'm Vijay Kumar, I'm the Dean of the School. Um, and this is an important uh, occasion for us, an annual occasion for us, where we continue to celebrate uh, the accomplishments of uh, a dear friend, an alum of the school, and a former dean, uh, Dr. Joseph Bedonia. Um, before I introduce uh, Dr. Gary May, Chancellor of the University of California, Davis, I would like to spend a few minutes talking about the man we honor today. Um, Dr. Bedonia earned two degrees from us, the Bachelor of Science in Electrical Engineering, and the Doctor of Philosophy from the University of Pennsylvania. And in between, he went to the school up north, uh, the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, where he learned to, earned a master's degree. He joined the Penn Engineering faculty as an assistant professor in 1964. He went on to become the director of the Moore School of Electrical Engineering, then an associate dean, and then finally dean of the School of Engineering and Applied Science, from where he, a position he served in from 1981 through 1990. From 1991 to 2005, Dr. Bordonia served at the U.S. National Science Foundation, or NSF, first as the head of the Directorate of Engineering and then the deputy director for the entire foundation, where he was also the chief operating officer. He did so many things for Penn and for Philadelphia, but one really important thing he did was to found PRIME. And many of you don't know about PRIME, it stands for the Philadelphia Regional Introduction for Minorities in Engineering in 1973. Back in the day where people asked, well, why would engineers worry about mentoring kids in STEM? Uh, but he was, of course, ahead of his time. He was a pioneer in this area. Uh, this is a program that supported integrative engineering and science learning for fifth graders to 12th graders, and also teachers of fifth graders and 12th graders. As dean, he established Penn Engineering's Office of Minority Programs. Uh, the director, founding director, uh, Dr. Co uh, Cora Ingram, is here today. Um, it's, it was the first organization of its kind in an engineering school. I think it was the first organization of its kind anywhere, uh, but definitely in engineering schools, there was no, no dean at that time thought it was important to have an, uh, an organization like this within the school. Now it's called the Office of Diversity, uh, Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion, and 40 years later, uh, this office is thriving and doing a very, very important job uh, in our university. Uh, throughout his career, Dr. Bordonia worked to include underrepresented populations in science, technology, engineering, and mathematics education. Um, and of course, we as a school are proud to continue his work and celebrate uh, his legacy. Today we are fortunate to have with us Chancellor Gary S. May join us to speak at the third Joseph Bordonia Forum. Chancellor May earned his master's and PhD degrees in electrical engineering and computer science at UC Berkeley. He joined UC Davis in 2017 after a 30-year career at the Georgia Institute of Technology in Atlanta, where he was the dean of College of Engineering, the largest and the most diverse school of its kind in the nation. Chancellor May today is a highly engaged leader with a passion of helping others succeed, one who believes that success is best judged by as UC Davis' seventh chancellor is to lead the university to new heights in academic excellence, in inclusion, in public service, and in upward mobility for students of all backgrounds. Indeed, throughout his career, he has championed diversity, equity, and inclusion in both higher education and the workplace. He developed nationally recognized programs that attract, mentor, and retain underrepresented groups in the STEM fields of science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. In 2015, President Obama honored him with the Presidential Award for Excellence in STEM Mentoring. He's a prominent voice in higher education. He's a member of the Boyer 2040 Commission, which was created by the Association for undergraduate education at research universities to design a blueprint for excellence and equity in undergraduate education. He's a commissioner of the Council on Competitiveness. This is a national organization dedicated to growing America's economy 
fostering innovation and increasing productivity through public-private partnerships. Chancellor May has earned numerous honors for his research in computer-aided manufacturing of integrated circuits. He's authored more than 200 technical publications. He's contributed to 15 books and patents. He's a member of the National Academy of Engineering and also the member of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. In 2021, he was awarded a Lifetime Mentor Award from the American Association for the Advancement of Science and an honorary doctorate from the Georgia Institute of Technology. I could spend another hour going through this biography, but, uh, but Chancellor May, we are so, so honored that you're able to take the time to spend the day with us. Uh, I know you have a very busy schedule and we're truly grateful for this opportunity to host you. Everyone, please join me in welcoming <laughs> Chancellor Gary May. Thank you, Dean Kumar. Sometimes the introduction is longer than my speech. <laughs> Some people like that, actually. Uh, good to be here with you. Um, I want to thank Dean Kumar and President McGill and all involved in the invitation for me to speak with you today. Um, before I start, I have a bit of a confession to make. Um, I've been giving variations of this speech for more than a decade, this presentation, and I kind of started becoming more selective about doing it, and I've been doing less of it, but uh, when I uh, learned that uh, this was going to be uh, the Joseph Bordogna Forum, uh, I could not turn it down. Uh, uh, he was a tremendous mentor and uh, friend to me uh, as a young uh, academic. Uh, I just want to acknowledge uh, Ray Bordogna, Joe Sun in the audience, and his wife. Uh, thank you for being here. Um, I first met Joe uh, when I was a graduate student uh, on a faculty recruiting visit here at Penn. I also first met Corey Ingram on that same visit, if you remember. Uh, uh, later, I was fortunate to work with him over many years uh, when he was at the National Science Foundation, uh, uh, as, uh, first as engineering assistant director. Um, and later, uh, well, during that time when I was uh, spending time at NSF, I served on the Engineering Advisory Committee and the Committee for Equal Opportunity in Science and Engineering. And I would eventually chair both of those committees, and Joe would eventually become deputy director at NSF, a position that he held for six years. Joe's leadership, uh, particularly in the area of enhancing diversity in engineering, was incredibly impactful. Uh, in fact, one might argue that the reason that NSF has a broader impacts criterion for proposals was largely due to Joe's advocacy. Um, I've spent much of my own 30 plus year now career focused on diversifying the STEM fields as well. And I know that many of you uh, have likewise been positively been impacted by, by Joe's wisdom, his passion, his heart. Uh, he was an enduring champion for underrepresented students at Penn and around the country. And for underrepresented engineer, engineers and aspiring leaders like Gary May. So again, it's a pleasure to be here and in some small way to continue uh, the conversation and help carry on the legacy of Joe Bordogna. Um, so, this forum is, is dedicated to a range of topics related to engineering and um, uh, the important issues at the nexus of technology and society. Uh, I'm going to focus on what I call the diversity imperative uh, and why this represents a grand challenge for our profession, why it's important, and how it will benefit everything that we do. But before I get into uh, creating how we create a more diverse future for engineering, I just want to set the stage by just sharing a little bit of my own personal journey, if you'll indulge me a bit. Uh, let me take you back to the beginning, <laughs> uh, way back to the beginning, uh, that uh, handsome lad there uh, with an oversized cranium uh, is me. Uh, grew up in St. Louis and had an early love for Lego and Erector sets. And I didn't know this at the time, but those Legos were uh, the building blocks, if you will, of my career. My kids would call that a dad joke. <laughs> <laughs> um, later, I discovered uh, Star Trek, and uh, my imagination, you might say, went to warp speed. Um, that was another dad joke. <laughs> my, I saw spaceships defying the laws of physics, and I saw a fantastic universe of phasers and transporters and the Vulcan mind meld and all those sort of things. 
And uh, the first time anyone ever saw a flip phone was in fact on Star Trek. And my fellow Trekkers in the audience will know that the, the pad devices used by the crew uh, look a lot like our iPads and tablets that we use today. Uh, and more importantly though, for me, uh, Star Trek, on Star Trek we saw perhaps the first, first vision of a multicultural society. Uh, the Enterprise was guided by a diverse crew, Scottish, Asian, Russian, African American, even a Vulcan. And they worked toward common goals as they journeyed through space and grappled with philosophical issues on their many adventures. Star Trek really opened my mind uh, to the value of diversity, particularly technology-related diversity, uh, diversity of race, gender, and background. And the idea has stuck with me throughout my career. Uh, when I wasn't watching Star Trek, I spent a lot of my childhood reading comic books and learning about the heroes and their superpowers. Fun fact, I have about 14,000 comic books in my collection. And um, that number is growing. I still go buy comics every Wednesday. Um, and some may wonder why a distinguished university leader recognized for serious scholarship has not outgrown his childhood fascination with superheroes. Uh, of course, their powers are interesting, you know, especially to us engineers. And if we're being honest, you know, raise your hand. How many of us became an engineer because we wanted to build an Iron Man suit? <laughs> <Me>. <laughs> I was a few billion dollars short in capital to do that, but, uh, but more importantly, through the X-Men, the Avengers, and the Justice League, uh, uh, we learned that people can use their powers for good, and the world could use more heroes and fewer villains. Now, you may have noticed, uh, if you're paying attention, that I just covered three things that were vital to creating a bright future for engineering. Imagination, diversity, and a mindset geared toward making the world better. Uh, so my childhood fascination with Lego, Star Trek, and superheroes, and apparently cosplay, uh, <laughs> eventually led to a uh, career, uh, research career focused on, as you heard in my introduction, semiconductor process modeling and computer-aided manufacturing of integrated circuits. You might say I was ready to boldly go myself, and yet uh, some of my friends even today say I'm a unicorn. People don't expect to see someone like me in, in STEM or in higher education leadership. You just don't find many black men in, uh, with PhDs in engineering. You don't find many black men who lead major research universities. Um, during my undergraduate years at Georgia Tech, I would look around the lecture halls and uh, classrooms and wonder if I was supposed to be there. And in those days, I was often the only black person in the room or one of the few in the, in the classrooms or laboratories. When I finished in uh, graduate school at UC Berkeley in 1991, I was one of only about 30 African Americans that year who earned a PhD in engineering in the United States. That's 30 in the whole United States. We could have all sat in this room and had a conversation. Um, and those numbers really haven't improved much, sadly. Uh, African Americans currently earn between three and 4% of the PhDs in engineering disciplines uh, each year. Um, when I joined the faculty at Georgia Tech, uh, there weren't many African-American faculty members. I believe I was a third in, in, in electrical and computer engineering. Um, and I do remember when I uh, visited the mail room, and Mark Allen will remember this mail room in Van Leer. Uh, it was also doubled, doubled as the copy room. The copy machine was in the mail room. And one of our colleagues, I won't name, asked me if I was there to fix the copy machine. <laughs> and um, I wasn't. <laughs> uh, so that just illustrates that people didn't expect to see someone like me on the faculty at a, at a place like Georgia Tech. More recently, after joining UC Davis, so these things persist. Uh, I attended the meeting of chancellors and presidents, that was the, the uh, attendance of the meeting, of our athletic conference. And someone at that meeting, as we were introducing ourselves, you know, I'm Gary May from UC Davis, someone uh, asked me, well, what do you do at UC Davis? So I think this was a meeting of presidents and chancellors, <laughs> so what do you do? <laughs> uh, so, uh, you know, unfortunately, um, you know, the same, you know, stigma stereotype is true for women and other, other underrepresented groups in STEM fields, and, and this still is the sad current state of our profession. Uh, let me just pose the question, so who, who belongs in engineering, who belongs in STEM more broadly? Despite our best efforts, many women and minority groups just don't feel that sense of belonging. We know that um, the proportion of underrepresented populations remains abysmally low in STEM. It's been an intractable problem in our profession for many years. 
these are numbers based on uh, the 2017 to 2019 American Community Survey for all engineering disciplines. Uh, they show 5% uh, uh, black engineers, 9% Hispanic, 13% Asian, 71% white. Um, women overall comprise just 15% of the engineering workforce. Uh, and by the way, this number hasn't changed much in 20 years. In 1990, women were about 12% of the engineering workforce. So uh, I think we can do better, and I think we must do better. Uh, so I, I would submit that diversifying the field is imperative if we want, if we want to build on uh, engineering's legacy of uh, extraordinary impact on our society. The world needs engineers, innovators, and leaders to address some of our greatest challenges, most of, most of which are global in nature. Uh, the environmental, uh, I'm sorry, the environment and global warming, clean energy, food production, healthcare, infrastructure, security, and on and on. Um, many of these challenges are among the National Academy of Engineering's 14 grand challenges. Uh, engineers are focused on solving all these problems and many more, but to that list I would add a 15th grand challenge, demographic parity in engineering. And here's why I think that's important as a challenge. Uh, diversity leads to better outcomes. Um, it's at the root of innovation and technical advancement. The greater diversity we have in our research, uh, the more likely we are to solve problems and make discoveries that uh, address these societal challenges. And a wide mix of backgrounds and, and experiences really and ideas helps to make, make this happen. Um, we, we've seen some negative results that can be attributed to a lack of diversity. The first airbags in the auto industry uh, almost killed women passengers when they were deployed uh, in accidents because they were tested on crash test dummies that had male anatomies like the one pictured here. So when the bag deployed uh, on a, usually a shorter and stature woman, uh, it deployed into the woman's face, snapped her neck back, almost killed her. Uh, same kind of things are true for speech recognition systems. Uh, the first speech recognition systems, probably like speak and spells, for those of us old enough to remember speak and spell, uh, did not recognize female voices and didn't work for the little girls that were trying to play for them, play with them. Um, if you fast forward to today, and I have many examples like this, but you fast forward to today, uh, pulse oximeters that are used to measure oxygen levels uh, uh, that were used extensively during the pandemic for this purpose don't work as well uh, for people with darker skin like me. Their, the accuracy is less. Um, another example, um, uh, uh, facial recognition. We also find that some AI algorithms used for facial recognition have racial and gender bias. Uh, an African-American woman, shown here, tested various facial recognition systems wearing a white mask to partially hide some of her features. And she found that the systems work better on men's faces compared to women's. And she also found they work better on lighter toned faces. In fact, she recorded error rates up to 47% for darker skinned women like herself. Uh, by the way, this researcher is Joy Bulamwini, uh, one of our former students at Georgia Tech, who leads something she calls the Algorithmic Justice League, which I think is pretty cool. Um, these are just a few examples, uh, but they make the clear point, diversity as a practical matter just leads to better outcomes. I would argue if there were more diverse uh, engineers on the teams that came up with these particular products and processes, um, they would not have overlooked these uh, uh, design flaws uh, that affect uh, people with different backgrounds. Um, a number of studies point to the benefits of diverse teams. The, our, this article from the Harvard Business Journal um, there's still some of the findings from these studies. Among other things, the article notes that diverse teams focus more on facts, they process those facts more carefully, and they're more innovative, all found in this particular article. Uh, we don't just need the next generation of engineers to solve the world's problems, we need the next generation of diverse engineers to do so. Diversity and diversifying the field is an imperative if we want to do our best work, uh, plain and simple. Uh, it's hard to imagine a day um, without the many conveniences and life-changing innovations uh, that various feats of engineering have made possible. Electricity, potable water, sanitary sewers, radio, TV, computers, smartphones, bridges, planes, trains, automobiles. Uh, when you check your email, when you surf the internet, when you turn on the lights or use your GPS to find your favorite restaurant, uh, you're accessing the innovations of engineering. 
Engineers, as we know, are the problem solvers uh, of today and yesterday and tomorrow. They're also imagining the future, uh, whether those fu that future means flying taxis, homes that don't burn when a wildfire roars through, or personalized medical treatments that take into account individuals' unique genomic fingerprints, lifestyle, and environment. So in this sense, engineering has a direct impact on all of society. And, and you know, let me say that again. What engineers do affects everyone. And diversifying the field is imperative if we want to create an equitable future for everyone, if we want our innovations to serve everyone, regardless of their race or gender. Engineers are problem solvers. We make new things. We imagine what's possible. We share the aspiration of creating something that will outlast, uh, outlast us. So it's not just about making the newest, coolest gadget. It's about accelerating and advancing the innovations that make the world better for everyone. As educators, we're preparing students to solve some of the world's greatest challenges and to further the extraordinary legacy of engineering by creating the next generation of life-changing innovations. To achieve that vision, the future of engineering must be diverse. It must be infused with imagination and a mindset aimed at making the world better. So I'd like to just conclude with a quote from Joe Bordonio that sums up this idea nicely. He said this during a commencement speech that he gave at Central Michigan University in 2005. Here it is, quote, how can science help you accomplish extraordinary feats? Science is more than textbooks and laboratories. Science is a living, breathing way of being in the world. I call it living on the edge because discovery, the very heart of science, happens at the outer limits of human understanding. Still, understanding alone is only half the story. We need to, to be cognizant always of how that understanding supports the, the commonwealth, how it gets integrated into the collective life we all share. Thank you. Thank you, Chancellor May. I'm happy to take questions. Yes, I'm, I'm going to invite our colleague, uh, Professor Jennifer Lucas, to conduct the moderated discussion. Okay. Jennifer, please. I always need adult supervision, so thank you. Do you want to just use this? Okay, great. A very nice, very nice talk. Um, so, um, I, so now we're going to open the floor for questions from the audience, but I'd like to pose uh, the, the first question myself. Um, so, because it is so important to you know, have a diverse workforce, um, my question to you is what have you found in your experience, what are the things that you have found to be successful that we can do in increasing the pipeline? Yeah, there, thank you. That's a great question, Jennifer. There are many examples of best practices in um, the areas of recruitment, retention, and ultimately student success, and faculty success and development for that matter, in engineering. The things that uh, are, are sort of known to work well. Uh, for example, our, our uh, uh, summer bridge programs, which I know there's one here, those ha are proven uh, over and over again to be su successful. Bringing students in in cohort models also works well, and having them study together. Um, uh, and those are accomplished uh, often with uh, partnerships between different universities. At Georgia Tech, where I was for many years, we had a very robust partnership with the Atlanta University Center dual degree program and, and really is responsible for all the success and recruitment that Georgia Tech had in, in engineering uh, diverse uh, students. Um, uh, the basic ideas are, you know, raising awareness, um, preparation, consistent uh, funding and support, consistent resources over time. I would argue, and I've said this and, and not everyone agrees with me, but uh, I would argue that we know how to do this. You know, we know how to make this happen. We just have not had the national resources or will to make it happen uh, over consistently over time. We've got successful programs here and there, which I call kind of a thousand points of light, uh, but no constellation, right? So no systematic approach like we had with the GI Bill to have a transformor transformational uh, generational change in our, in our country. Something like that would, would, I think, get us over the hump. Questions from the audience? Just following up on that, are there um, societies or countries, nations that do it better than we're doing that we could perhaps try to emulate? That's a great question, and I, I will admit not knowing the real answer to that. I would say that there are few societies more heterogeneous than, than the United States. 
So uh, you know, I'm sure that there are countries that are having better success, but they tend to be more homogenous and not have the same challenges we have with, with integrating diverse uh, constituencies into, into STEM. Um, uh, but now that you've asked me, I'm going to go find out. <laughs> I'm a little worried about an embarrassing question from my past. <laughs> um, if I wanted to embarrass you, I'd point out that that um, copy machine that you were talking about was actually a mimeograph machine. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's true. <laughs> I, I have an oddly specific question. Um, uh, often it's the case in the classroom um, we'll divide up um, the students into teams, maybe to do labs or maybe to do homeworks or, or, or things like that, uh, to help them form study groups and whatnot. Is there any scholarship about whether, from a, a diversity and equity point of view, it's better for the professor to assign groups or if it's better to let people self-assemble? Because I've seen some people sort of get excluded during right. the self-assembly process. On the other hand, um, I can see the benefits of that too. So is there any good, good scholarship question. on that? Uh, in fact, my daughter was a computer science major at Purdue and she often complained that when they self-assembled the teams for projects, she would get excluded. Um, so I think self-assembly is not the right answer. Uh, I don't know that the professor or, or the instructor assigning is better. I think random samples, uh, random assignments tend to be the best uh, because uh, you don't have any bias. Uh, of any type if you do it randomly. But I do think you can't, uh, I think it's important to not have the same teams or groups consistently throughout the semester or quarter. I think you have to mix it up so that people get different uh, interaction experiences with other members of, of the class because even if you do it randomly, there's likely to be a particular group with some particular issue or problem that it could persist throughout the semester if you don't change up the group, if, you, if that's possible to do. Thank you. Yeah, sure. Uh, my name is Saurabh. I'm coming from South Africa. And uh, I have a question around community engagement, and uh, especially at the pre-university level between engineering schools and, um, and, and, the, and communities, and whether that form of community engagement is uh, something that you may have observed as being uh, effective uh, in terms of especially getting uh, you know, black students, but also uh, women uh, interested in engineering uh, programs? The short answer is yes. I think those type of activities are effective. What I would caution engineers, we tend to think we can do everything. Uh, it's much, those things are much more effective if we have partners like from a school of education or from some program or government agency or someone who's sort of ingrain, uh, 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 embedded in the community uh, and, and knows what, the, uh, what things work and what things don't work with that community. So it's, it's much better to do uh, such activities as a partnership than it is to go it alone as the College of Engineering or School of Engineering to try to uh, you know, uh, affect that change. Yeah, that's a great point. Thank you. Dr. May, it's good to see you again. Thank you for coming. Uh, can you address the issue of imposter syndrome, especially in places like this, and uh, if you ever faced that and how you overcame it? Sure. Does everyone know what imposter syndrome is? I should define it first. Imposter syndrome is basically that feeling where you don't belong here. I feel like I don't belong here. I'm not good enough to be here. I'm an imposter. Uh, it's a well-studied psychological phenomenon. Uh, and it's particularly relevant for people from underrepresented groups, uh, as, as you probably know. And you know, honestly, um, uh, I'm not an expert on that particular um, phenomenon, but I do know that it persists throughout your uh, career. I still occasionally wonder why I'm in this job <laughs> and if I'm not supposed to be somewhere else. Um, I, in terms of how you address it, uh, I think it requires um, uh, you know, good, stable support systems. I think you have to... Um, have uh, mentors or individuals that can help boost your boost your uh, bolster your confidence, um, and uh, you have to be uh, not afraid to address it directly and admit it. 
uh, because many people suffer with this imposter syndrome and are uh, reticent to, to tell people about it, uh, even though it's fairly pervasive. Hi there. Uh, thank you for that talk. That was really wonderful. Um, one of the things that you know I think you see in a lot of big companies, universities, you know, organizations of any kind, um, the people at the top will come together. There will, you know, discussions, come up with DEI statements, lots of initiatives like that. But oftentimes, many of those movements are are symbolic in the sense that at the top they're recognized, but they're not necessarily internalized by the community whether that be faculty or students um, or the university as a whole or the company as a whole. And, and what do you sort of feel are the paths that people can take um, to really bridge that gap between coming up with the idea, coming up with these statements, and really making that um, something that everybody internalizes so that the, the change is actually long lasting and, and something that people really, really take to heart? Yeah, great question. So, you know, after George Floyd was murdered, you never saw so many diversity statements, right? They were everywhere. Everyone was making a statement. But I would always say when someone would send me one, I'd say, let me see a picture of your board. There's <laughs> always a dichotomy there. Uh, not always, but usually. Uh, so I would say this. Uh, I tell my team this all the time. Diversity is everybody's job. It's not just the job of the DEI office. Just like fundraising, by the way, at the university. It's everybody's job. Uh, <laughs> it's, um, and and uh, it has to be taken into account when, in our evaluation processes, in our, um, uh, our planning, uh, our budgeting. Uh, you know, one of the questions I ask every year when I'm evaluating uh, my team leaders is what, how did they advance uh, or support diversity on, in their aspect of the university? And I used to do this as a dean as well. So uh, it has to be part of the value system of the organization. It has to be rewarded appropriately. Uh, and, and unless we're going to take that challenge on, uh, we're not going to be able to make progress. Thank you. Hi. Um, thank you so much for that. I guess um, the question I have is when we're having these conversations, obviously diversity is really important. Having heads in the room is really important. But what are the best strategies to actually have real inclusion um, I guess something I've noticed as a woman in engineering is, you know, you're always there and then people are like, yes, we have this woman in engineering in this space, but um, making sure that you can actually be heard and speak in those spaces and be included in the conversation and not just there as a token um, is something important. And I wanted yeah. to know outside of creating infrastructure in terms of like clubs and organizations and things at a university level, what are the best strategies to promote not only diversity, but inclusion? Yeah, that's a good question. So diversity, so you invite everybody to the dance. That's diversity. <laughs> but you dance with, with people. That's inclusion, right? You dance with the people that are, may feel left out. Um, part of that is uh, re related to the answer I gave on the teams uh, in the classes. You know, make sure that everyone has an opportunity to interact with everyone else. Um, I think also uh, uh, in inclusion uh, means uh, rather than sort of letting the conversations go where they want to go, you kind of make it a, 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 an effort to get every opinion or every point of view uh, from the group. Uh, because otherwise, they'll be the, the smartest person in the room or the person who thinks they're the smartest person in the room will answer all the questions or make all the c comments. So uh, the leader has to be very intentional about getting all perspectives. So there's a question back here in the middle. You could pass the, the mic back in two rows. Ah, thank you. Um, I love sport a lot. So um, I always try to observe a lot of things from there. Um, you see a lot of people, I mean, like a lot of, of youngsters going to sport because there's a lot of prominent black sport people that are vocal in that domain, you know. Take, for example, LeBron James, you know. Everyone knows LeBron James, you know. So we find a lot of young black People, uh, you know, kids wanting to play bas basketball. Right. They understand the sport very well because of how profiled he is in, in his domain. Do you feel like we could copy strategies of that extent? Sure. To say, I like, a lot of young people don't know what a silicone, uh, you know, chip designer 
do, you right. know, because they really can't fully relate to that thing. How can we adopt strategies of that nature to actually uh, encourage some of these young stars to actually take and esteem uh, yeah. these professions way better than we actually are selling it to them? Because some of these disciplines are really selling football, you know. I'm from South Africa. I don't know how big football is up until I got here. It's big. <laughs> it's really big, you know. And there's a lot of dollars that go into it. Right. So how do you profile and people like you, you know, to some black students who are... Uh, who don't even know what you, and simplify it in such a way that you can, they can be able to say, look, I want to be a silicon engineer, and really yeah. understand it, yeah. Yeah, that, that role models are so important. I too wanted to play basketball. I just had a power forwards game in a point guard's body. <laughs> <laughs> so that dream, dream died early. Uh, <laughs> But um, it is important for role models to be visible, accessible, approachable. If, I don't know if anybody remembers the television show, A Different World, which is a spinoff of The Cosby Show in, in, the, in the 90s. Um, there's a character, Dwayne Wayne, who was, uh, his, his story was he got a perfect math SAT, and he wanted to be an engineer. Um, I think what is less known about that is during those years when that show was on and the, that character was popular, uh, interests and uh, applications of young African Americans in engineering in, uh, rose significantly, noticeably. So, so um, role models are important. I, uh, and there's another more recent example. You mentioned silicon uh, engineers and, and, and designers. Uh, Intel used to do those commercials with people dancing in the clean room in the last few years ago. Anybody remember those? It didn't have any impact, obviously. Right? <laughs> <laughs> But things like that do matter. Uh, so I encourage uh, people, and I myself try to be visible in the community, do things like this, um, and let people know what I do and that you can be successful in other areas of life other than sports. Um, when I was an undergraduate, we had one um, black professor in the whole College of Engineering at Georgia Tech. Um, his name was uh, Augustine Essabor. He was, the, I believe, the first, not only the first black engineering professor, but I think um, among the first to earn a PhD in uh, uh, industrial engineering operations research in the, in, the, in the country. Anyway, he was very visible. He was the, the advisor of our uh, Nesby chapter, and he was cool. He had a real suave accent, you know. He dressed nice. He had a Mercedes. So saying all that to say, not to show myself how petty I am, but to say that the same things you see with uh, athletes, uh, the trimmings of being an athlete, we saw in a person who had a PhD in engineering, and that really made a difference to many of us, many of my peers uh, at that time. So it's important for us to be visible. Hi, Dr. May. Thank you so much for your talk and your example. I actually graduated from Georgia Tech while you were dean. and. Um, I didn't realize at the moment, but it really did make an, a difference being able to see myself represented among the faculty. I know you spoke earlier about the pipeline and how current efforts are meant to increase the flow through the pipeline, but um, you know there might also be a problem of leakiness with the pipeline, right? Where even though you're recruiting more underrepresented engineers into undergraduate uh, studies, they might, that might not translate directly to an increased proportion of you know, black and Latinx and other represented identities as faculty members. Yeah. Do you have any strategies that have worked um, in terms of increasing recruitment, specifically like at the faculty level, anything that search committees could be focusing on or doing better? Yeah, I'll, I'll mention two things. One, I'll just say that when the pipeline leaks, we have to have ways for the fluid to get back into the pipe. So, you know, non-traditional students and those kind of populations are important not to lose sight of. But in terms of faculty uh, recruitment and success, uh, we had a program at Georgia Tech for many years, um, uh, which had an acronym, FACES, and it had uh, three components. It had undergraduate research, and one of the products of my undergraduate research program is sitting here, Gerald Lopez. Uh, he's done well for himself. He works, works at Penn. Uh, <laughs> um, and uh, it had a sort of a, um, a graduate fellowship and enrichment component. 
uh, where uh, it was overseen by a committee of, of African-American faculty at the, uh, in the college. So uh, having a critical mass was important because people, again, the role model stuff and, and, and uh, people being able to see themselves in those roles. And the final component of the program was um, we took part of the money from the grant and gave it to uh, the, 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 uh, those that aspired to get faculty jobs as startup money at their first uh, uh, appointment, uh, which was harder to do than you would expect. Universities don't like to give their money to other universities, it turns out. But, <laughs> but uh, it did work out. And let's see, I'm trying to remember the numbers. So over the life of that program, uh, more than a decade, uh, more than 400 uh, uh, STEM PhDs to people of color were granted. Uh, by Georgia Tech, and um, you know, a reasonable number of those in the 30s went to become faculty members. Um, so uh, that, that, that's one example. Russ, did you still have a question? I had a question about student support and, and advising. So I don't wonder if there's best practices from Georgia Tech and from Davis about how we could best support underrepresented students in engineering. Because like at a place like Penn, we have lots of resources, maybe too many resources, frankly. Yeah. And I think there's a lot of noise out there. And ultimately, we don't want to take away the agency and the drive of, of certain types of students. But at the same time, we want to give them positive reinforcement that they can be an engineer. So right. I wonder if you have some thoughts on best practices and in a place like Penn, what might work better than other? So I'll go back to the, the first with the, the role models and examples and raising awareness and showing students he, this could be you and this is the quality of life you could have if you pursue this career. I also think that I mentioned earlier uh, the cohort model of um, hiring or en enrolling groups of students uh, uh, in, a, in a cohort that can sort of be with each other, uh, go to classes together, social events together, whatever they do together, and not be feeling isolated and have these uh, as persistent of, uh, imposter syndrome as they might otherwise have. Um, uh, there's some pretty good literature on that, uh, a fellow by the name of, uh, uh, what was his name, gosh. Uh, Aston, I think, was the author. Uh, some work that was done back in the 80s of, of bringing uh, groups, cohorts of students, African American students into, at, in that paper uh, through the curriculum together and uh, comparing that to the control groups that did not do that and much better success with the folks that had been in these cohort models. I can probably find the reference if you give me some time. Okay, I'll chime in with a question. So you were at Georgia Tech for 30 years, moved to UC Davis. So they're, they're very different institutions. Yeah. So what, <laughs> and I, I imagine that Georgia Tech is you know, quite more diverse maybe than um, UC Davis. So how, how, have you, how was that informed, like your approach to sort of trying to uh, recruit uh, diverse students and faculty? Like what are you having to do differently? Yeah, great, great question. First, let me say that 30 years includes my undergraduate degree, so I'm okay, not, not that old. Sorry. So. <laughs> um, um, but the two institutions, there's levels of difference. So the, uh, Georgia Tech and, and UC Davis are different types of institutions, one heavily STEM focused, one more comprehensive. Davis is not Atlanta, I've learned. <laughs> um, and then Georgia and California, also quite different um, culturally, politically, et cetera. Uh, so, but there are some things that you can, uh, that are transportable. Uh, we had a lot of success at Georgia Tech uh, because of this program with the, uh, the AU Center Schools. Um, the same thing does not exist in California, but the demographics in California, uh, the, the Latinx population is exploding. And so um, we are now uh, at, at uh, UC Davis uh, on the cusp of being what's considered a Hispanic serving institution, which means 25% of your undergraduate domestic population is from that demographic. Um, so uh, I'm saying all that to say take advantage of the, what you have available to you. So we focus a lot of our efforts on, on that population, not exclusively, but certainly that's low hanging fruit for us. So some of the same things we did at Georgia Tech, uh, a weekend where we invited potential graduate students to come visit the campus, we do at UC Davis. Uh, we get a different uh, demographic in the, in the, in the tea, invitees, but um, the same sort of effectiveness has been, um, has been shown. So, um, uh, and, and also I'll just end with, uh, 
the same kind of commitment I thought we had from leadership at, at Georgia Tech, I've tried to instill in our, our uh, leaders on our campus at UC Davis, and I think leadership matters. Other questions? Kevin? Thank you very much for the talk. So you have a captive audience of faculty and future faculty, and you mentioned that diversity is everybody's job. Mm -hmm. Are there one or two things, practical things, that you'd like to see every faculty member do to help us achieve these goals? There are a few sort of simple things, like you know, uh, uh, do an online implicit bias test, right, and learn about that. If you have, I mean, maybe maybe Penn requires that, so maybe you don't have to do that. Uh, and uh, kind of recognize or have some awareness of your own uh, uh, bias. That's very helpful. Um, call it out when you see it, which is not as easy. Uh, but you don't have to call it out in a menacing way. You can call it out by just sort of helping people realize when they're doing something or saying something that might be uh, considered offensive or, or biased. Um, you be intentional about uh, your own teaching and recruiting. Uh, uh, make sure you're not uh, 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 implicitly uh, 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 biased against people from whatever background. That uh, Make sure that you're, you're evaluating people in an equitable way. Um, but those are, I think those are kind of low-hanging fruit type things you can do as a faculty member. So I, I know I'm not the only one wondering about the picture, your picture up there. <laughs> can you please tell us what that is? Yes. Uh, uh, UC Davis has a very renowned art department. And one of the uh, faculty members who was a sculptor, his name is Robert Arneson. Uh, has these sculptures, which we call eggheads, all around our campus. Um, this particular egghead, uh, it, it's called Eye on Merak. Merak is the building in the background, this administration building where my office is. And you can't see it, but uh, there's, a, there's an, uh, an eye in the middle of the chin, I mean, uh, um, behind the chin of the head. And the symbolism is this. One, he thinks all of our leadership his, their heads are upside down. We don't know what we're, we're doing. And two, he's keeping his eye on us. <laughs> so, so. Thank you so much uh, for uh, what you've been sharing. And well, um, I might have some issues uh, expressed in my question since English is my second language. But um, so um, maybe my, my question would be um, how to answer to comments or when people from your community, I come from an indigenous community in South America, uh, the Quechua community. And um, so sometimes when scholars, Quechua, Quechua scholars, come back to our home uh, from academic exchange here in the US or other places, sometimes they see us, uh, you mentioned this term, unicorns. Uh, so how to address those comments and maybe inspire uh, other girls, especially girls, because in my community, girls are more subjected to tasks uh, at home and, uh, and limited only to that. So how to ins uh, inspire them and let them maybe helping them open their perspective that they can they are more capable than they previously thought of they would be yeah that's a, a good question I, so one uh, so I have a friend who used to always call me black unicorn and he actually bought me a little sculpture of a black unicorn and I have it in my office on my desk it's more blue than black but he tried so <laughs> uh, I would Two things, I would take pride in being the unicorn. You accomplish something, you should not be ashamed of that, you should be proud of that, but you don't wanna be alone at the same time. You don't wanna be the only unicorn, so you wanna go out and, and uh, uh, replicate yourself and, and, and talk to people who have the same potential uh, that you have or had and, and help them to see what some of the uh, benefits are of following the path that you followed. So I think, again, being visible and, and approachable and out in the community is important. Being an ambassador for the profession among people that uh, in your, uh, uh, from your uh, background uh, in, in your community is, is really important. So um, that, that's, that's my advice there. But uh, again, uh, role modeling is, is really, really important. Well, 
ask another question. Sure. So um, one of the challenges is that when, when um, people speak about diversity and the importance of diversity um, and give talks and lectures about it, often the people most in need of this message are the ones who aren't here. Yeah. And um, how, have you found effective strategies to get through to these people or? <laughs> yeah, this is the old preaching to the choir <laughs> syndrome, right? Uh, so I mentioned before when I uh, evaluated people in, uh, when I, in my leadership roles, uh, some of them weren't at these talks, <laughs> but they still had the same evaluation to, to uh, uh, respond to. So I think the onus is on leadership to make sure that um, uh, uh, even though the people, some people aren't here and don't think these th things are important, they need to know that you as a leader think these things are important and are high priorities for the college, the uh, institution, the, the university. So uh, uh, that, that would be my response to that one. Yeah. So any last questions? Anybody want to chime in? So thank you again, Dr. B. Mine is just a shameless plug for my programs. <laughs> okay. So on March 17, since we're talking about diversity, we have a celebration of diversity at Penn Engineering right here in this hall and also in the Levine lobby. We're going to have our students perform. We're going to have some of our staff members perform. And if you want to perform and be a part of it, please come join us. So I want to extend an invitation to everybody here. That way, you cannot miss your email or say you weren't told, please. OK, thank you. DJ, what do we charge for commercials at this? <laughs> <laughs> All right, so uh, this has been a very nice talk, so let's thank Chancellor May. Thank you.